star one. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us to hear about Calibration's role in the manufacturing jigsaw puzzle. Uh, my name is Sarah Wallace from TransCat, and I'll be your moderator this afternoon. Our presenter is Howard Zion. Uh, he's TransCat's Director of Service Application Engineering. So for the first part of our time together today, We'll have the presentation, and then at the end of the call, we'll answer your questions. You'll notice um, in your webinar controls to the right, um, there's a question, a box for questions. So you can just put your question in there, and then at the end of the presentation, we'll go through there and um, answer them. Uh, I also want to mention that this webinar is going to be recorded today, or is being recorded today. Uh, and each of you will receive a follow-up email with a link to the recorded webinar and the slides of today's presentation, um, probably about two hours after the presentation finishes today. So at this time, I'm just going to turn it over to Howard. Thank you, Sarah. Good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are coming from. Um, I want to talk to you about some concepts, uh, how calibration ties to manufacturing you know, things that start in manufacturing and then push to the need for calibration um, and making sure that there's no disconnects there because that can happen and it does happen more often than it should. Um, we're going to cover what the manufacturing goals are. We'll talk about how things get segregated or split out um, as different people in a company are responsible for different functions and departments. Um, and then the piece of the puzzle that is all about the calibration support piece. And sometimes that appears to fit, sometimes it really doesn't fit, but it looks like it should. And then following up with how we make sure you get the pieces to fit properly. So manufacturing goals, the big picture there is to make products that are in a market demand because you want to sell them and people they don't want them. You don't want to be into that type of a product. Um, so market demand is important. You want to be profitable. You want your, your product to be effective. And you want your product to be safe. So the, the whole big picture can be split into parts. And if we put it all together, and excuse me, some, some of this uh, animation is a little bit slow, but if we put it all together, we can see how it all fits. So all of these functions and others are required to make this happen, to be able to manufacture products of, of any type. Some of the functions of the manufacturing process are split into separate departments necessarily. Some of the uh, sub-functions, some of the sub-assemblies of uh, the product are either outsourced or, or handled by different departments internally. And that in itself causes uh, miscommunication sometimes or, or a lack of communication, not intentional, but it can cause things to get dropped or missed. Example, our materials are purchased from multiple sources depending on what they need and the quantities and the you know, purchasing people get involved to uh, get the lowest cost or making sure that you have good quality but low cost. Uh, Sub-assemblies can be farmed out to local tool shops. Um, some companies enforce the quality of the parts onto their supplier to make sure they're receiving good parts. Other companies have receiving inspection to check sample of the supplier parts for quality or maybe a 100% inspection to make sure you know, they get what they pay for and it's going to work in their product. So all of these things cause uh, different functions to get split out and then that requires, um, it puts a bigger burden on communication, uh, not only verbally but through documentation to make sure people understand the job they're doing and what they need to do to make sure that you get as a corporation what you're asking for, what you're paying for. So how does that affect the calibration function uh, as one focal point? Well, it goes back to understanding what the original point of calibration was for in manufacturing. And that's really to make sure that you don't lose that connection between designing your product, um, finding methodologies to manufacture the parts of your product to uh, get your product to market, and then the pieces that tie to 
making sure you have good measurements on all of those parts of the product. And making sure you have good measurements means that you need to select suitable instruments and a number of other things and make sure that your calibration is supporting what is needed for those measurements on the product. And that creates a calibration silo, especially if it's outsourced, but even for an internal lab that can happen. And how does that affect manufacturing? How does that affect the goal of, of the company in making their product? So what can happen is calibrations may be taking place, but that doesn't necessarily mean that measurement assurance is in place. And we'll get to talking about the components of measurement assurance in a minute because it's not just calibration. So as an example, um, I'll use an Omega HH82A, which is a temperature indicating device. And uh, one of the examples I have seen in, in my experience is one of these devices, uh, which, by the way, has a channel A and a channel B. So there's two channels that can be used for temperature measurement. Um, it can also be used to measure differences between temperature values, temperature probes. And uh, so it requires calibration to make sure that if this is being used on the production floor to make quantitative measurements about the product being good or bad, uh, then that needs to be calibrated. Both channels, and by the way, each of the channels can handle one of four thermocouples, J, K, T, and E. Um, and so what I've seen is calibrations that have been performed on these, or in one example, a calibration that was performed on this, where only channel A was calibrated, and only two thermocouple types were calibrated. Um, and the question to that manufacturing uh, quality manager was, where are you using this? How are you using it? Let's find out for sure what you're doing with this. And it turns out both channels were being used, all four thermocouple types. Um, and so they didn't have any longer any traceability on channel B or the other two thermocouples on channel A. That creates a problem because they're making decisions about the product being good or bad, and they really don't know if that instrument is telling them the right answer. So on the left, you can see, taking it back to the analogy of puzzle pieces and how things fit together, that it looks like the piece on the left would fit into the calibration um, portion, respectively. But the piece on the right looks like it could fit in there as well. And if you take the larger piece above it and put it into place, you find out that the piece on the left really isn't the right piece. It's the, it's the one on the right that shows that it fits into the calibration piece. And so just like that jigsaw puzzle example, some calibrations can look to the untrained eye like, yes, I got the calibration done. I have the certificate to prove it. Looks like I'm doing what I should for that requirement in my organization. Yet when you get down to looking at the details of it, it wasn't fully calibrated, and it really doesn't support the operation like it should. And so you're at risk in that situation of passing product that could be actually bad. Or the alternative to that is that you could be accepting um, product that really should have been rejected. So what, with this example, what similar risks might you have with the calibrations that you're currently receiving? It happened with this item, it can happen with others. And I've seen it multiple times where calibrations really aren't supporting the production process. And that's not, that, that breaks down the entire measurement assurance program. So if manufacturing of any type is interested in maximizing their profits and making sure they have good product safety and quality, then they must have an active measurement assurance program. So let's talk about a measurement assurance program and what that consists of. Um, there may be additional components to this, but this gets the meat of it. It's got to have the right tool for the job. It's got to be suitable for the intended use, to, to be able to make the measurements uh, on the item that you're manufacturing or in a process of that manufacturing of that item. Uh, it has to be the right tool for the job. It has to be regularly calibrated because you're making decisions, again, about the product. So. You're basing those decisions on instrumentation that gives you quantitative values. And those calibrations 
have to support the process where the instrument's used. They have to supply the correct tolerances. There are situations where you can get incorrect tolerances uh, based on using a different procedure that, uh, or source of specifications that can cause that. Uh, calibrations have to be valid, meaning measurement uncertainties that support that you can actually quantify those values of the measurement of the calibration. And so that's all very important in making sure you, you don't lose that piece of what you're trying to do in the manufacturing process. So in an internal lab, um, they probably have a more, uh, a greater chance of getting it right because they should be tied in to some degree with what's going on in the production floor. And if they're not talking back and forth, then that's where that can get lost. The other thing is, metrology is a, a fairly small world, and, and so a lot of people have gotten their training through the military, and people are comfortable with using what they've learned in the military, and that is the military procedures, CAL procedures. Sometimes those procedures um, are modified, don't cover the full calibration of the instrument because it fits what the military's need was. Sometimes they change the tolerances from what the manufacturer had, or they don't keep up with the changes of what the manufacturer states as they update their specification. And so if there's any disconnect there, it follows through to whoever uses those procedures. So you have to be very diligent in making sure that it meets what the customer's expectation is. The customer's expectation of you know, the user of the instrument should be, or usually is, based on what the manufacturer says that instrument can perform to. And that is their specification sheet. And usually, if they have a, a, a valid, a good metrology practice calibration procedure, um, then it would follow that as well. So you have to be very careful that the calibration isn't drifting away from what the intent was when the person selected the right tool for the job. Then once it's calibrated correctly, and you've picked the right tool for the job, you've got to use it correctly. And that could be a matter of training of the operator. It could be gauge R and R studies to figure out you know, how to minimize variances in the use of the instrument, uh, complexity of how you know to use the instrument. So there's there's a lot that goes around uh, that piece of measurement assurance because if, if you have everything calibrated right and you pick the right instrument, and somebody uses it wrong. There goes your measurement insurance, and there goes the whole idea of manufacturing a product that's known to be good. Accounting for irregularities in the production process, um, process measurement uncertainties. A lot of people don't think about this concept, but there are uncertainties in every measurement that's made, not just in the calibration lab. And so on the production floor, uh, I kind of alluded to using the instrument tool correctly, gauge r and r studies. There, there could be a number of things that you need to pay attention to outside of just the calibration of the instrument, making sure it's reading correctly, that can affect the measurements on the product. And you've got to make sure that you're taking those into account. And then when you get your information back from a calibration event, um, you've got to determine if you have an out-of-tolerance investigation that needs to be performed, and you need to do that correctly so that you're taking those errors of the instrument back to the decisions that were made about the product or any process where that instrument was used. And in doing that, you'll find out if you made some decisions that could have accepted bad product or could have rejected good product. And then corrective actions for taking that out-of-tolerance uh, impact if you found that there's some central problems with accepting good product or vice versa. You've got to take some corrective actions there. And that could be instrument recall. It could be rework of your product or components, a number of actions that can be taken. But that was the whole point of traceability in the first place in calibrating the instruments to make sure you know that you had good product. And if you know that you may not have, you've got to take action on that. All right, so I want to go through an example. Simple temperature measurement. The manufacturing engineer is designing a process where he needs to measure solution or she needs to measure solution used to treat the product. The process measurement is 350 degrees Celsius. The engineer determines that, you know, outside of a two degree window around that value, you start maybe having problems and the product isn't treated the way it needs to be. So that's a determination manufacturing engineer needs to, to figure out for their product where those limits would be for a process. 
Now you've got to pick the right tool for the job. What, what is the instrument that's suitable for this measurement? Would it be an instrument with an accuracy that's equal to those process limits, plus or minus two degrees? Most people would understand that's not a good idea because the instrument is allowed not to drift that full amount over its cal interval, and that can directly impact previous process measurements and decisions about the product. So let's say that the instrument's been calibrated today, and it was adjusted to nominal, so it's reading perfectly, or within the uncertainty of the measurement anyway. The instrument's used now on that same day to go out and measure that solution temperature. And the temperature is right at nominal. Everything is aligned and perfect. Sun is shining, birds are chirping, everyone's happy. That process measurement is good. Now, on the last bit of the instrument's calibration interval, it's going to be used before it's uh, recalibrated. Used to measure the temperature solution, and lo and behold, it's right at 350 degrees Celsius, right at the nominal point. So in that cal interval of, of that instrument, as we used it to make measurements about this process, uh, on the first day and the last day at least, we see that it was at nominal, and we're happy. Process measurement is good. Now the instrument goes in for recalibration, and then subsequently it's adjusted to return it to nominal. As found, readings show that the instrument drifted to the upper limit of 352 degrees C. Remember, we picked an instrument that has the same tolerance as the process measurement that we're trying to make. So now it's drifted to its upper limit. What does that do? That drift occurred over its cal interval, so it probably didn't happen all at once unless uh, the instrument was damaged or something. But that is called an intolerance reading, and there's no flag to the person getting the cert back saying, I should check into some problem that I might have. They just see that it's intolerant, and then it was adjusted back to nominal, and they go on their way. So did that move all at once or a little bit over time? Probably a little over time. Uh, is uh, typically the situation. And how does that impact the measurements or the decisions about the process since the last time that instrument was calibrated? Well, because you don't know or if you don't have any information that would tell you otherwise, you have to assume that the last known good condition of the instrument was the last calibration performed. Everything that instrument touched over that period of time, even though the instrument was intolerant, you're going to take a look at how that impact uh, affected your, your decisions. Everything has to be reviewed for potential uh, risk. So it wasn't reading at nominal in your process as you thought it did. And on the first day, since we have to go all the way back, unless you had some other type of checks and balances in place, like uh, uh, checks on the instrument to see if it was drifting, uh, then you have to assume you go back to that first day when you know, likely it wasn't bad, but you don't know, and so you have to say it wasn't actually reading 350. It was reading high, it, the instrument that I used for that was actually higher than that. When I bring it back to where it should have been nominally on the instrument, that brings my process measurement down the same amount. And now I'm really at the borderline of the process acceptance limit, and that lower tolerance is where I was actually sitting. Same thing with um, the reading on the last day, the end of the cycle. But that process measurement is good because it's in the tolerance. It's at the lower limit, still in the tolerance. Should have you concerned, though. What if some of those readings throughout that interval, of that instrument drifting over time, was at 348, and you said, that's in the tolerance limit, I'm good to go. Now that you know the effect of the instrument being at its upper limit and the fact that it should have been lower by two degrees, it no longer would be acceptable. And that intolerance calibration on the temperature instrument was not flagged as a situation that puts you at risk. Do you see the dilemma here? It's not just about out of tolerance situations that flag to you. You must do some evaluation of an impact on your, your decision. It's about 
any shift in that instrument and making sure that you understand what it did to the decisions about your process. Because now you have a situation where you are actually well beyond the acceptable uh, tolerance for that solution in the process of manufacturing. And that process measurement was actually bad. That's what we call a false accept situation. So we wouldn't really want to pick an instrument that had the same tolerances as the process that we're looking at, we're trying to measure. We want something more accurate. What if we pick something that had an accuracy twice as good as the process that we're measuring? Now if it drifts to its upper limit over its cal interval, process readings would only have been off by half of the process tolerance. And that helps you. But there's still a risk situation. What if an instrument was selected that's four times as good as the process tolerance? Now if it drifts, then your process readings would only be off by one quarter of the process tolerance. Again, if the instrument only drifted to its outer limit. And the whole thing about Manufacturer specifications on what their instruments, how their instruments will perform, is about two things. It's about setting uh, the cal interval over which it'll fold those values, and then determining what those values are for accuracy and other parameters. So uh, the manufacturer says, "I'm expecting that you know the majority of my products that I make for you, the instruments I make, uh, will hold these tolerances over this period of time," and uh, so because they should, it's not likely that they'll go beyond that, although it does happen. Uh, but we're now we're using that kind of a logic or a thought process to determine the right instrument for the job, the suitability of the right instrument for the job. Four to one ratio is usually where traditionally people have gone. Um, we could take it further, 10 times better, 100 times better. But the problem is that there's limits to technology that won't get you there in some cases, for, depending on the parameter of measurement. And eventually it becomes cost prohibitive to go too far with that concept. And as I said, a 4 to 1 ratio is usually sufficient to reduce to an acceptable level the probability that an out of tolerance would have had an impact on the product or the process decisions during that calendar. And for some uh, measurements, uh, you know, this 4 to 1 ratio can't be achieved. So you have to live with a higher risk, and you've got to know how to manage that to, uh, to your benefit. So with this 4 to 1 ratio that we're looking at, an instrument that has four times uh, less tolerance limit than the process tolerance. Uh, if your reading was at 348 during the use of the instrument over its cal interval, now it really should have been at 347.5 because that's a quarter of that tolerance. That's what the instrument's tolerance would be. And you still are in a situation, even with a 4 to 1, where you could have false accept decisions on the process or the product. So you still have to deal with that, but it minimizes it. It gets it to a more manageable level. So here we still have a process measurement that's bad. We still have a false accept situation. How do you deal with that? Lesson learned here is even intolerance results can impact your process measurements. Um, there, I'd be willing to bet there's a number of people in the audience who never realize that. And hopefully this has helped you to understand why. All of your Cal data should be reviewed against your process measurements to understand the impact to the product. And I call that not an out of tolerance NCR because it's an intolerance NCR evaluation. At this point, I'm sure a lot of you are shaking your head saying, are you kidding me? I gotta do all this extra work for intolerance? Hold on, I think I have a better solution to help you out there. Impact studies are expensive. You don't wanna have to do those. It consumes valuable resources, very costly time. It's rework, which means you're not working on new product, which means that takes away from your profitability cost thousands of dollars per evaluation event. Parts or product that you've uh, passed already with false, false success situation um, may have already been released or shipped by the time you get the calibration information in or out of tolerance on this, the instrument you used to, to make those decisions. Um, so
sir. I think I've lost uh, the control here. Can't forward. Go ahead and try one more time. No. Okay. All right, I'm going to take control for one moment. Sorry about this, everyone. Okay, there you go. We're back on track. Thank you. Uh, so if the product has been released or shipped um, to uh, distribution warehouse, to clients, it's out of your control. Now you might have to do a product recall. That can be very expensive. You don't want that. Uh, if it hasn't been released, you might have to do rework, and that too is expensive because it, it again, consumes um, workers to now rework the product instead of making new product. And, uh, plus the cost of the materials if you have to scrap it. <clears throat> so this risk can be reduced. That's the good news. And the concept there is guard banding the process limits. We'll talk about that here. What is guard band? First you want to determine your realistic tolerance limits for the process as part of your normal uh, determination suitability of the instrument, process uh, tolerances, and comparing those. And then you want to take the instrument tolerance, uh, which is the value expected for maximum drift of the instrument over its calibration interval, and back that off from your upper and lower limits to arrive at new lower and upper acceptance limits so that if the instrument drifts over time, over its calibration interval, uh, to its maximum value, you negate the need to do even intolerance uh, well, this would be an intolerant situation throughout its interval um, if it was only to the maximum value. So you would negate the, the need to perform those intolerance non-conformance non report evaluations. And that process measurement is now protected unless the instrument drifts further than its tolerance limit, and then you still have an out-of-tolerance situation that you have to perform an MTR evaluation on. But that should significantly reduce your risk from where you are today. So to summarize all of this, make sure you implement a good measurement assurance program that takes all of the different components into account. So, because the goal there is to protect your product, to make sure you're not making bad decisions about it. Understand and exercise good suitability of the instruments tool for the rent tool for the job. Guard band your process tolerance limits to reduce costly NCR evaluations, or if you're not aware of that fact that intolerance can affect that, uh, you know, mitigate that altogether now. Understand both the process that you're trying to do for your manufacturing and the calibration of the instrument to ensure that the intent of preserving good measurements on the product is not lost. And that's not just the manufacturing engineer, that's the operators who are actually performing the test. That's the person in charge of getting the calibration done, whether it's an internal lab or somebody who outsources it. Um, all of those people need to be tied together with these concepts to protect the measurements, decisions made on the product. Everyone has a role. Be thorough in your nonconformance report evaluations to make sure, again, that you're using all that information that you're spending money on to ensure whether that those decisions were good or bad and, and fix that process if it wasn't. If you're in it over your head, get some help. We're here to help you. Any questions at this point? Thank you, Howard. Um, let me look at our question box and see some questions. Um, if anybody has a question that they want to ask, you can go ahead and just in the right in your webinar controls, you can type um, a question in, and then we will um, go through them and Howard will answer them for us. 
questions or comments, I'm open to either. Oh, okay. So you, you won't deny any attaboy? <laughs> no, no, not just that. Um, there may be people who have experience with what I'm talking about and may want to share some um, related topics. Oh, okay, yeah, excellent. So we'll just take... <laughs> what were you going to say? <laughs> All right, we have one here. Um, can you define uncertainties or uncertainty and just give some examples? Sure. Um, I'm not sure what level you're approaching the question with, so I'll I'll start with some basics. Um, uncertainty of measurement uh, really goes to um, let's say that you are um, using a recipe that your mother used for making cookies and you've decided that you're going to make cookies too. And for some reason, you think you've followed everything that she's done. And you make the cookies, and they just don't turn out the same. Either they're not as crisp or not as soft or don't quite have the same flavor. But you're not sure why that happened. And, and the reality behind that is that there's a number of variables that can happen in measuring a flour or the type of flour you used or uh, the type of chocolate chips you used. If they were chocolate chip cookies, um, the baking uh, altitude, temperature of the oven, you know, there's a number of things that come into play. All of those variables that can change the outcome are uncertainties of the measurement. So if, if that helps you, um, then that's what we're talking about with measuring equipment as well. All of the things that we do in a calibration lab um, to determine the true value of the instrument or as close as we can get to it, uh, you never get to an exact value but within some estimate of the variables that can cause you to be off in making those determinations are the uncertainties of the measurement, same concept. In the production process, um, when you use an instrument, well, let's, use, let's say, for example, you're using a, a dry block calibrator, if you're familiar with that. Uh, that's where you have a, uh, an instrument that generates temperature. You have uh, one or more wells in the instrument where you put temperature probes in them and you're making comparisons uh, between two temperature devices. And um, so in that process, if your probe is not the right size for the well, if uh, there's variances in um, temperature from well to well, if there's variances in the height, uh, the length, or the depth that you put the probe into the well, uh, the amount of stem of the probe that's sticking out above that causes the cooling effect, there's a lot of variances there in making a measurement in your process, uh, which is a determination about the process or your product. So no matter what you're doing, there's uncertainty surrounding um, the values that you're coming up with. And you need to nail those down and understand them or control them if you can. OK, thank you. We have another question here. Um, my company is trying to reduce costs by lengthening the calibration intervals of some of our equipment by reviewing past cal data. Is there a general document or guidelines I can look at to approach this process? Yes, absolutely. Um, the NCSL International um, Organization uh, puts out recommended practices, and their recommended practice one or RP1 document is all about the different methods for determining calibration intervals. And it's anywhere, uh, I think there's one of six methods in there, anywhere from as simple as uh, you know, whatever the manufacturer recommends to uh, you know, formulas that you might look at based on the history of the instrument to very complex equations that, uh, you know, for some of the more complex methods there. And so you want to look at that and see which one fits your needs um, and then implement that. So you can get that on NCSL International's website. Okay, next question is, um, this person says, do I understand you correctly? Is it possible to have a piece of equipment that has accuracies which support the process accuracy requirements, yet the uncertainty related to the user, determined by gauge R&R, could mean it is not an appropriate piece of equipment? Uh, yes and no. That, that uh, could be that it's not appropriate because it's too difficult to use and to train people on are maybe too costly to do all of that. But 
that, that aside, I mean, that's un, unusual. Um, it, it could be that that throws your measurement assurance program off. So you've got a good instrument that has good accuracy, that's suitable for the process, uh, has a good calibration on it, and then if you can't get the operators to be able to use it correctly or it causes so much uh, influence on the process that you can't control it, then yes, that would cause it to be no longer valuable to you for your process because it affects your measurement assurance and your decisions about the product. Uh, so you might either find a way to make that one work or find a different product. Okay. Um, moving right along. For clarification, is the 4X calibration based on the LAL limit or the process limit? Uh, repeat that again. I didn't get the part about the 4X. Uh, yeah, 4X. Is the 4X calibration based on the LAL limit or the process limit? Oh, um, well, that that depends on what you want to do there. You can either control that internally by saying, I know that if the tolerance that gets reported back to me, which, by the way, the calibration in that case would follow the manufacturer's tolerance as a default, if it comes back to me and it's outside these values, then I know that I need to take action. All right, so you set those up internally, knowing for each instrument what those values are. And you're looking for that when you review the Cal data. The alternative to that is to ask your calibration supplier for a customized calibration that has those tolerance limits to your needs. And therefore, when you get the report back, or the calibration report, uh, when it says auto tolerance, now you know you have something you've got to look at. So there's a couple ways to handle that. And there may be a cost to doing it that way, but uh, that's an option for you. OK. Um. Okay, what are the most common, or more importantly, the highest risk you see when companies use their own associates to perform calibration of the company's equipment? Hmm. I would say that in the calibration process, that, that there's boy, there's a lot of areas there that can be a problem. Um, you know, the accreditation process is valuable in if you use it to help your technicians understand how the things they do, the actions they take, the, the ways that they handle the measurement impacts their ability to get a good answer for their calibration measurement. Um, and so you can become accredited and not do that. You know, there's ways to do that. And then you don't gain the value from it. But accreditation can help those technicians become more proficient in those concepts and be aware of what they're doing in the calibration event beyond you know, the normal calibration training you get, uh, either through the military or elsewhere. Um, so the, uh, the biggest thing I think I see is uh, just jumping to a conclusion that uh, you don't need to uh, put a limitation on an instrument if you believe you're customizing it to the client's need. And in that case, there's no forewarning unless Unless the operator is looking at the cert to see that you didn't calibrate certain functions or you didn't calibrate the full range of the instrument or you changed the tolerance limits for some reason. And that, to me, is a huge red flag for auditors. Um, they could find an issue there where you believe you're using the instrument that's fully calibrated and you haven't looked to see that it's limited and there's nothing that indicates to you that it's a limited situation, uh, either by the tolerances or the functionality of the instrument. So I see that too much. Um, and that, that is a huge risk problem that I don't know that a lot of people understand uh, is a risk for them. OK, next question is, how can I be sure my calibration service provider is using this practice? Uh, you know, it's just like anything else you buy. You take a look at it. Uh, to see if it's, it's got good quality and has what you expect. And you can't just drop it and leave it. You've got to keep checking on it occasionally. So uh, awareness of these kind of concepts is one way to take a look at your calibration supplier and start looking for things that uh, seem out of, out of uh, place. Another way is to hire a consultant to help you with that, somebody who's an expert at it, um, if you're not familiar with it or you're not comfortable with those decisions. And uh, you know, it doesn't take much for somebody who really knows what they're looking at 
to reveal to you what the problems may be. And those shouldn't be biased answers, you know, just to get business if, if uh, that's what their goal is. It should be things that you yourself can go verify and say, yeah, that is a problem. And it's not getting me where I need to be. OK. Um, does the calibration lab calibrate to the manufacturer spec or allow for differences? Uh, well, I'll tell you what TransCat's philosophy is and what our calibration policy states. And that is uh, that we calibrate as a default service to the manufacturer's tolerances using methodologies that uh, support that process. And the methodology piece means that we're looking at, hopefully, first a good manufacturer's uh, calibration step-by-step -step procedure. And if they don't have that or if it's not sufficient to support a good calibration, then we're going to be looking at other documentation. And that could be a military uh, document, a guidance document, um, ASTM, ASME, ANSI types of documents. There's a number of ways that you can get to that. Uh, if, if we don't see anything that makes sense out there uh, from the manufacturer or from other organizations, then we'll design one ourselves write it ourselves and, and use other source documents to support that. Why we run it the way we did. Now, not everyone does that. So that's a question you have to have directly to your uh, calibration supplier, whether it's internal or external to your company. And uh, the question should be, what is your default service? Now, the second part of that question was, can you deviate from that? Absolutely. Customer can have us uh, meet their needs meaning they can change the tolerances if they don't need the accuracy of the manufacturer's states for the instrument. They can change the interval if they want. You know, their risk that they're taking when they do that, uh, but they, have, they need to be knowledgeable to make those decisions. And they can change the test points that they want included in the calibration to reduce them, increase them, whatever they need. Uh, clearly, a, a calibration supplier should be there to support your needs for, for your process. Um, and so, uh, that should be indicated as a different cal than what the default uh, manufacturer's calibration will be. And you need something in your quality system that identifies that. The way we do that is uh, if it's less than what the manufacturer would provide or, or the tolerances have been changed, then we're going to make it a limited calibration. And if it's uh, greater than what the manufacturer would normally do, there's additional test points or whatever. We call that a customized uh, calibration or a customer requested calibration. And there's uh, words on both the label and the certificate that indicate that difference. OK, we're getting a lot of good questions here. Um, when you talk calibration, are you talking for the calibration of the instrument that you use to calibrate the sensor or control that controls the process? Or are you talking the calibration of the control that controls the process? Uh, calibration applies to both of those. And so the examples I gave uh, was about a process measurement for temperature, and you're using a temperature measuring instrument with a probe to make those decisions about that process. And then you send that instrument in for a calibration on the instrument. Um, and so there are um, instruments out there that are used to control, you know, instruments that are calibrated and used to control other processes that are used to make decisions. And those are both calibrations. It's more of a system cal for a control system. Uh, but it's still a calibration to get it aligned so that it's reading properly, that the decisions made using that system are good decisions. Okay, next question. Is there a way to determine gauge accuracy? Um, example, we have a counter that measures cable length, and we have a calibrated cable. I would like to validate the counter is at a 0.6% accuracy. Um, how, sh how, should how should we use what we have to determine the counter accuracy? I believe that's the question. I think my event okay. is worth so talking We're talking about sounds like a footage counter, and you're using a single cable length that you must have measured somehow. So you've got to take a look at that uh, measurement process to make sure you have good uncertainty surrounding it. And then if those are acceptable in relation to the tolerance of the footage counter, um, then it would be OK to use that cable length to measure the accuracy of that footage counter by wrapping it around it and seeing if it's uh, sufficient or running it through it to see if it's giving you the same result. 
If it's not sufficient to do that, then you've got to come up with another methodology. Okay. Um, what would be the recommended level or type of training of an individual tasked with determining measurement uncertainty? Um, you know, it's an evolving process for an individual, um, and it starts by getting your feet wet, you know, quite honestly. Um, for a lab that becomes accredited, and I can tell you from experience, when we went through this process in our labs, it was a difficult process to go through because a lot of our employees didn't have a mathematical background to support or statistics background to support the concepts uh, to be able to get into it. Now, you can train someone to go through the step-by-step -step process of creating a budget, but uh, that leaves a lot of room for error because the difficulty in creating uncertainty budgets is understanding all the sources of error that can happen in the measurement. And if you don't get all of those, it's not complete. So it's kind of you don't know what you don't know, and then your budget is incomplete. So part of it is having good experience. And I would say somebody with, you know, <clears throat> for the particular measurement, uh, you know, three to five years experience just to get started with those concepts. If you're doing multiple parameters across the board, you need to have that kind of experience in all those different measurements. And then good math, uh, algebra background, statistics background, some training on that would be a huge help as well. Okay. Um, does TransCat offer a service of auditing an existing CAL program? Yes, we do. We have consulting that we offer. Um, and we have done that for a couple of our clients. Um, we are more than willing to do that for you. It doesn't take long for us to walk through your facility and grab some examples and look at the certs and help you understand where the flaws are and where things are being done that are good. Um, would it be easier, I'm not sure where the comparison comes in, but um, would it be easier for the engineering department to change drawings to allow for the equipment tolerance? Change what? Um, to change drawings to allow for the equipment tolerances. To allow for the equipment tolerances, meaning that your current drawings don't have them, and should you add them, I assume that's what that means. Um, feel free to type back if you have uh, clarification on that. But let's go with that for now. Uh, your drawing of your part or component should reflect the tolerances that are allowed for the design, right? And then it should call out which ones are critical for the calibration lab to perform if it's not all of them, right? And, uh, and so some may just be simple reference uh, datum. Some may be uh, measurement measurements with tolerances that are critical. You know, if it's the angle or if it's the radius of, uh, of an edge to make sure that it's ergonomically comfortable on the product, uh, you, you may or may not care to have that checked in calibration. But if it's something that aligns and tries to fit with another part, that's something you'd want to identify and put a tolerance on those. And yes, that should be on the drawing. Good, good engineering control change on your drawings is critical to communicating uh, to all parties that need to be looking at that and working with it. OK. Um, is there a specification defining how long a piece of calibrated electronic test equipment can sit on a shelf before putting in service? Uh, not to my knowledge. Um, I, yeah, I don't think of, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would be something that would give you guidance on that. That's more of a, you know, what is the environment? Well, first of all, good storage and handling of the instrument, making sure that you understand uh, what the manufacturer recommends for how you store the instrument uh, in the right conditions uh, is a big piece of that. Now, uh, if it's going to sit for a long time, to me, that's a, a situation that you're better off recalibrating it than guessing. And so running it through that process again when you're ready to use it again is a, a pretty good idea. Um, the other thing I want to say that this kind of brings up is many companies, and this is another thing I see not just internal labs doing, but um, their quality uh, departments are not catching the fact that when you calibrated instrument, it's the as-received values that are so critical to all those decisions you've been making during that last cal interval. And what I see is um, a company will decide, well, we don't need this instrument anymore, that product line is shut down, whatever the reason, and they just archive it, they just deactivate it. 
without doing a closeout calibration. And that closeout calibration is the end of your traceability process. It is critical. And people just discard that, and then they have no idea if they made bad products and the decisions on the product. So it's critical that you do that on a regular basis. OK. What or who do you think would be considered as a valuable certification body for calibration tax? Uh, I assume that means accreditation body? Um, it's looking it's, like for the calibration tax if there's certification. Oh, I see. Uh, OK. So the, uh, there's a couple of uh, points there. One is the training for a technician to become qualified to calibrate instruments. And that uh, you know, largely comes now from um, educational facilities, uh, institutions like uh, you know, Butler College is one that comes to mind. There's two and four year colleges that offer quality and metrology related degrees. Um, so I would recommend that for their training. And then for certification of a technician, the American Society for Quality has the Certified Calibration Technician um, certificate. And that's a uh, same as any other certificate that they offer. You have to uh, take the body of knowledge, understand everything that you need to know, study for it, take the four-hour exam, open book exam, and pass that to be able to become certified. And then you have to maintain a certain number of points uh, over a period of time to become requalified. And if you don't have the, the number of points uh, from attending uh, seminars like this, from attending NCSL, Measurement Science Conference, um, the work that you do on a daily basis, if you don't accumulate enough points in that time period, then you must retest um, to maintain that certification. But you know, it's usually pretty easy to get, get enough uh, points to maintain it, especially if you're working in the industry. OK. Um, do you believe a three-point calibration is best in class, or should it be a five-point calibration? That all depends on the instrument design. Um, so I assume that uh, you know we can take that and apply it to a multimeter that has multiple ranges for voltage. And on that, you're going to want to check the linearity of the device on one range at least, and then check the other ranges. And that could be single point counts. Uh, but again, it depends on um, where you're using it, how you're using it, and it needs to go back to that process to see how critical that is to the measurement. OK, next question. Uh, in the manufacturing environment, what would be considered a minimum training level to perform calibrations in-house, i.e., the tech level? Yeah, I think that also ties to the other question about certification. It really um, for someone to be able to make good decisions about the process of the calibration being done correctly, um, it doesn't just have to be the technician, although it's a good idea for the tech to be aware of those concepts. But whoever's managing that operation really needs to understand how this all ties together to what manufacturing decisions are about product and guarding the calibration process to make sure it's supporting that. Um, and then the technicians can be uh, monitored, supervised, trained uh, as they come along. Uh, more senior technicians then obviously with more years of experience should get involved at that point with the same concepts that the manager of the lab is looking at to understand how that all ties together. And you should have a succession plan that keeps bringing people that direction. OK. Um, can. Can you not determine calibration frequency of the instrument you are using on the product you are using it on as far as how critical it is to your process? The calibration interval? Um, yeah, well, they say calibration frequency, but I'm, I'm wondering if that means interval. Yeah, calibration frequency. Based on the production process in which you use. Now, that, that calibration interval should be uh, really focused on the instrument's ability to perform. And, and I'd start with the manufacturer's recommendation first, and then monitor the success or failure of the instrument over time, and let it guide itself to where it should be, including to the point that if it's continually failing on, on the same function, uh, you know, and you're constantly having to either repair it or adjust it, 
it's creating a lot of risk in your system, and you should look at a different uh, model or product to take care of that uh, issue. Okay. Um, how? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You can use that historical information to help make the decisions about the Cal interval after that initial point. So it shouldn't be based on what the process is doing. Okay. Um, how do I know when my instrument needs calibrated? Do I need to wait till or very close to the expiration date, or can I use it a few days after the expiration date? Uh, it, you know, there, don't take this the wrong way. There's no magical uh, time period there, and it's not going to turn into a pumpkin the day of its uh, due date. Um, the, the thing is that you're taking risk the longer it goes. And so if you're going to use it, if you're going to make a decision to change the calendar goal and lengthen it, or you're going to extend the calendar goal beyond its due date or use it beyond its due date, um, you're taking risk there. And you've got to either build in check standards throughout that calendar goal to monitor it and see that it's not changing significantly if you're going to do that, or um, uh, be willing to accept the risk. Because if you end up with an out-of-tolerance situation, even after that extension or you know, lengthened calendar goal, you now have that much more product that you've got to go back and look at and understand that you might be recalling that. So it's a cost decision, a risk decision, and uh, it, it depends on really the cost of what that recall could be or the rework of the instruments if it's wrong. Okay, we have quite, uh, enough time for about two more questions. So. Um, does a piece of equipment need to be calibrated if it is compared um, if it is compared to a known measurement? Uh, okay, so you're kind of using it. It sounds like as a transfer standard, depending on what you're comparing it to. And transfer measurements, um, you know, if it's truly a transfer measurement instrument, that should be done on a regular enough basis that you don't allow the drift of the instrument, short-term instability of the instrument, uh, or even the long-term instability of the instrument to cause an effect of transferring those measurements from the known standard to uh, the process. Um, other than that, and, and that's a limited volume of instruments that you should be doing that with, uh, other than that, you should have your regular your instrument regularly recalibrated to monitor it. And again, that, that decision on interval goes back to product risk and decisions of, you know, product and where you're using it and what those costs are. And uh, so you kind of balance that um, to, to figure out what that optimal calendar will be. Okay. Um, does criticality cal does the criticality calibration interval depend on the criticality level? Hmm, I'm not sure I understand uh, that question. I might be asking it wrong. Yeah. Criticality, meaning uh, I'm wondering if that's related to FDA regulated environments and whether it's uh, GMP critical or non-GMP. Um, so let's assume that it's that. And uh, the criticality of the use of the instrument, uh, again, relates to risk and where you need yeah, to set your instruments in. Yeah. I'm sorry. Just going to say they clarified. They said, yes, GMP environments. And so it's funny with uh, GMP criticality because um, you know long ago pharmaceutical industry has put that into place and they use those levels throughout the plant and determining what's critical, what's not. And uh, and the younger uh, medical device industry hasn't quite caught up with that yet. So they don't, and I haven't seen that much in the medical device industry. Um, but it's still important, and it's a concept that's good to say you know, if I'm using this. Um, Multimeter to check, uh, you know, um, the voltage of a transformer and power to the plant. Uh, you know, well, you don't want to have be without power, but it may not be as critical a measurement directly related to the product. And so, criticality of the instruments on the product because your product may be much more expensive, um, and the risk of having an out of tolerance event or even an intolerance that affects your product can be very costly or a product that has to be recalled or, or reworked or scrapped. And so that decision on the calendar goal and uh, tolerances that you use and setting upper and lower acceptance limits as opposed to um, the manufacturer's limits 
to mitigate your risk, that, that's all good to make sure that you're minimizing the risk and the exposure of liability to your company. Okay, we'll just finish with one easy one, it looks like here. Um, are there any regular publications, such as magazines, that address the world of measurement, assurance, and calibration? Uh, you know, I haven't seen a, a ton of that, and maybe it's just my lack of exposure to it, but that's why I'm writing more and more white papers on measurement assurance, because, you know, over time, at least in the 30 years that I've been uh, performing metrology, I've seen an evolution uh, in the concepts for metrology, including changes from NIST and uh, ILAC to the definitions of trace of metrolog metrological traceability and uh, how that is focused much more now on total components of measurement assurance than it is just on traceability and uncertainty uh, components. And um, so I don't know that there's anything out there yet that really focuses on that, but there needs to be. And um, I think it's very important because these pieces, if any one of them gets lost or missed or not supported, breaks down the whole system. And it's too critical for that. And, and so that makes you wonder if those things are broken so easily in, trace, in the traceability chain and the measurement assurance process, then how is it that we make products that work? Well, sometimes we don't. And uh, sometimes we scrap product and rework product and don't realize it's tied to this. Hard to quantify. Absolutely. Uh, but I'd be willing to bet a lot of it's related to this breakdown of uh, supporting a measurement insurance program that keeps you on uh, in check. Okay, well that concludes our time for today. Um, if you have any further questions or would like more, um, more information about TransCat services and offerings, um, you can just contact us at 1-800-828-1470 or visit us on the web at transcat.com. So thanks for joining us today, and we hope that you found this information useful and applicable to your job. Have a great rest thank of the week. You. Thank you for attending, and thank you, Sarah. Sure.